starting in 15 seconds. Hi, and welcome to Answers News for uh, Monday, November 30th. I'm Avery Foley. I'm here with Bodie Hodge and Dr. Jennifer Rivera. Hello. And we have a live studio audience. You guys want to clap and say hello to our online uh, viewers? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so as people are jumping on here, um, we want to say a huge thank you to all of our supporters so far who have given towards our um, end of year campaign that we have going on right now. Um, we are we have a, our biggest match ever in the history of Answers in Genesis, $3.5 million match um, for gifts to help sustain the ministry through the slower winter months. And we are very, very excited. We are at $3.2 million already, which is Incredible. So we have been just so blessed by your generosity. So thank I, you. I would love to see it double. Thank you so Even much. doubled than that. So. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so if you'd like to join with us in that, tomorrow is Giving Tuesday. So a lot of people kick off their end of your giving tomorrow. So if you'd like to join us in that, um, answersingenesis.org slash donate is the place to go to, uh, to check that out and see the thermometer as it keeps rising towards our, mm -hmm. our goal yeah. there, which is really exciting. So if you have donated, thank you, thank you, thank you from all of us here at Answers in Genesis. Um, no, next thing we want to talk about here as people jump on is our VBS for next year, uh, Mystery Island, Tracking Down the One True God. So this was going to be our VBS for 2020, but everybody knows what happened in 2020. So this <laughs> yes. is going to be our 2021 VBS, and we are very excited about it. Um, it's going to help kids discover the attributes of God, discover who the one true God is, and that we know who he is from how he's revealed himself to us in the word of God. There's a lot of mm -hmm. false ideas about God in our culture, um, and kids need to know who the one true God is and that we know about him from his word. So that's what this VBS is going to explore, and we're pretty excited about it. So um, yeah. you can go to answersvbs.com to learn more about that and to order a kit uh, for your church for next summer. The other thing we have to announce, which I am extremely excited about because this has been months of work um, for myself and my husband, is Shoes Off, an exploration in God's creation. So we have hinted at this so, a couple so of times. So why are you so excited? Why am I so excited, excited about this? So <laughs> Back in July, my husband and I started working on a kids' show for Answers TV, our streaming platform, and it is officially launched as of like an hour ago on Answers.tv, so we awesome. are extremely excited. It's been several months of a lot of, very, of hard work, but we are so excited it is ready for people to go and watch, uh, so you can check that out. We designed it for kids ages like three to eight. But in our test group, we've had kids as old as 13 who really enjoyed it. Oh, so awesome. we are so really excited. You have to explain, you know, why a shoe felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our tag, we're the shoes and we're off on an exploration in God's creation is like our tagline because um, my married name is uh, a longer version of shoes. So we cut it down to shoes so it'd be easier for kids to say. <laughs> so it's uh, my husband, Trevor, and I and our three kids are featured in the show. And we just go explore God's creation, meet a lot of the really cool creatures God has made and um, teach basic creation and biblical truths to little kids and, through and you can get this on Answers.tv? So, it's exclusively yes. on mm -hmm. Answers.tv. It's the only place in the world that you can find it. So if you get it's a subscription to that, you can get in front of the TV, <laughs> take your shoes off and watch shoes off. <laughs> Just relax. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's great. So um, you can try a week for free if you haven't tried Answers.tv yet. And you can check that out. Um, and it's only $4.99 a month or $39.99 for the whole year. And it's so great because everything on there is safe. So you can everything. put your kids in front of it and not have to worry yep. about things that they may stream. So. Mm -hmm. It's yep. a nature program yep. that actually honors God and his word, so you don't have to worry about it. So right. I definitely encourage you, please check that out and let us know what you think of it. Uh, we're very excited to be launching that. So I won't talk any more about it, even though I could talk like the whole half hour <laughs> about it because I'm so excited. We will move on to our first one here, <laughs> which comes from my home country of Canada. We had to talk about this while I was yes. on the show, of course. <laughs> Uh, most Canada story ever. Canada, uh, Canada officials warn motorists, do not let moose lick your car. So if you're ever tempted to let a moose lick your car, <laughs> not a good please idea. Please don't do that. No. <laughs> so the background for this story is that... It's the salt, isn't it? Yes. Moose need salt. <laughs> And apparently cars are, they call them in the article here, driving pretzels. <laughs> and the moose have figured out that if they lick cars, they get their salt. Obviously, in Canada, we get a lot of snow. You got to put a lot of salt on the road. Mm -hmm. um, and it, of course, collects all over your car. Canadians are very familiar with that problem. And apparently the moose have realized if they lick the cars, they get the salt that they need. And so motorists have been parking along the side of the road in um, Jasper, Alberta, to attract moose, to lick their cars so they can see moose. First no, no, of all... No, that, that's like a car wash, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Moose are like the scariest thing ever when you see them in person. They are so huge and so scary. Do not attract moose to your car. So the officials are warning people, please don't do this because the so, moose so get you used stop to cars. Them? Did you yeah. like, you hoser, get out, take off, eh? I mean, that's you have to how use you do Canadian it. lingo or what? Definitely. That's how they respond. <laughs> But um, yeah, they say it'll get the, the, the moose too used to being around cars, and you don't want to hit a moose with your car. It is not. I'm well, yeah, sure I that's mean, much it, worse than it, a deer. If they hear much a car, worse than a deer, they might, yes. might come, and the right. last thing you want to do is run yeah. into it. Because mm -hmm. they're big moose enough and cars that, not that not if you mix. hit them, they'll, they'll come through the windshield. Yeah, oh, that's yes. what makes it dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very dangerous because they're way taller than deer. Like you just take their legs right out from underneath them if you hit them and then they smash into your windshield. Bad thing. So yeah. don't, if you live in Alberta, all my fellow Canadians, please don't let the moose like your or car. Or anywhere that there's moose. You <laughs> there's your PSA do that. of the day. Don't let the moose like your car. <laughs> yeah. so. But that was uh, only in Canada. Only in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So getting into the, the real news here, we have this first one from The Guardian. Let us disobey. Churches defy lockdown with secret meetings. So you think this has to be from like some, you know, communist country or right, something. Like China yeah. or, you know. Nope. Right. This right. is from the UK. Whereas the byline says, gathering in barns, cafes, and bookshops, worshipers flocking to illegal services around the country. So because of the lockdowns, uh, many people in the UK are not allowed to meet together as a church, mm -hmm. so they are defying what they believe to be government overreach into the lives of, of Christian citizens, and they are clandestinely meeting in barns and in cafes and things, so they're still able to obey the Lord's command to worship together. Well, you know, in the early church, they had to do that. They oftentimes mm -hmm. met in homes and that sort of thing. They had secret symbols that they would use to mm -hmm. signify that they were like a safe house to meet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're kind of like doing that here because they actually say it's like by word of mouth to trusted people. Like they're mm -hmm. giving secret information. Hey, we're going to be meeting at this house. And who would have thought it would be in the UK? I mean, you know, a few hundred years <laughs> ago, it's hard to believe in, in England too, but in a different way. You know, because Anglicanism was very popular and it was kind of imposed upon the people. And so, actually, a lot of people left England and they came to places like America, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the United States, Canada, different places like that, seeking religious uh, freedom. You know, so I mean, we're still seeing this. The difference now is it's not Anglicanism; it's secularism uh, that's being imposed mm -hmm. on people. They don't want people to worship at all. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're seeing that. Uh, but, but here's something I want to want to step back and look at, you know, because Christ is king of kings. Mm -hmm. He's actually the one in charge over all of them. And he says we should worship. Mm -hmm. So what do you do at that stage? Uh, really what it is, you, you need to understand that, that it's some of these government officials that are actually trying to defy Christ the king. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And they've actually said some people have been arrested yeah. You know, who went ahead and met and defied those orders, mm -hmm. and police are apparently going in yeah. and arresting certain individuals for mm -hmm. that. Yeah, they mentioned at least three people throughout mm -hmm. here that and, were and, You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, there's that command, you know, love your neighbor, so therefore obey these guys and that sort of thing. Well, you're supposed to obey God first. That's the first and the greatest commandment right there. Well, I like how that pastor said, yeah. he goes, we answer to a higher authority, right? Mm -hmm. He says, yeah. when there's a contradiction between the laws of the country and God's command, the Bible is very clear that God's command must win out. Mm -hmm. And so I mm -hmm. thought that he was very mm -hmm. bold on his yeah. stance that he was taking. And they said mm -hmm. that, you know, these church leaders said they're, they're abiding by the social distancing guidelines. They're mm -hmm. even wearing um, face coverings and stuff while they're meeting. So they're, they're obeying mm -hmm. the ones that they can obey, the laws and rules that they can obey. But they, or they say we cannot obey and forsake God's command to meet together. So we are going to meet together because that's what the word of God tells us to. So. Yeah, it's interesting that, uh, you know, one of, one of these guys here said, never before have churches been forced to comply with closure orders or be criminalized. And uh, that, that's in England. And so you're, we're seeing that. Uh, if people don't think that the church is under attack in various parts of the world, mm -hmm. places you didn't expect, it really is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's definitely under attack here in the United States as well. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We, we see all kinds of, of very inconsistent and, rules where casinos are allowed to be open, but churches have to be closed, or strip clubs are allowed to remain open, but churches have to be closed. And it's just so yeah. incredibly inconsistent. And you see the direct targeting of um, Christians and churches mm -hmm. in many of these different mandates that governors yeah. are, are putting out. Now, they pointed out that there is a legal challenge over there uh, because mm -hmm. Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights actually protects uh, the freedom of religion. They should be able to, to have that. So, I mean, in the same way here in the United States, you know, a lot of churches are, are being attacked and their religious freedom is being taken away. Same sort of thing is happening over there. Mm -hmm. so. so this one leads, I thought it was an interesting contrast with the next one, which comes from Discern. Survey finds 20% of churchgoers have not attended or watched a service since pandemic began. So you have, on the one hand, people who are willing to risk arrest 
being arrested, perhaps fines for meeting together secretly. And then on the other hand, you have uh, one in five churchgoers um, here in the United States that haven't attended a service since mm -hmm. the pandemic began back in March or and haven't even tuned in to watch their church's online services since that happened. Mm -hmm. And they do make a good point here about the elderly people. You know, because I do believe, especially if you're elderly in your home and you're told to stream into your service, that you may have some difficulty. And they do talk about, you mm -hmm. know, they may not be as tech savvy. They may not be able to go online and stream the service. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my so mom doesn't even have the internet, for example. It. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think she has a computer either. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that sort of thing does happen. Right. But, you know, in another sense, you know, it does give people a reason to, to maybe sometimes go elsewhere. Maybe that's uh, not reflected in the stats. I know other times there's people who listen to other pastors and people, you know, who are more prominent um, mm -hmm. as opposed to their local church. So, um, you know, I look at these stats and I go, okay, yeah, I can see some of this, but at the same time, there might be more going on that we just haven't been able to understand from mm -hmm. the statistics, but... And but, it point, they, they mentioned in the article that it points to the broader, there's been, there's been a continuing exodus from the church for a long time now. This isn't a new problem. It just seems like the pandemic has kind of sped it up, so to speak, a little bit because it's completely disconnected people physically from the body of Christ in many, in many different um, areas as many churches aren't meeting. Right. So it's completely disconnected them physically. And now... And I think the biggest danger is that they're, when we are able to reopen again, they're not going to come back because right. they get yeah. so used yeah, to this new schedule. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go to church on Sundays, yeah. and mm -hmm. so people are, not, are going to be less likely to return mm -hmm. to the you physical know, church. I'm actually glad you brought that up about church engagement. It's actually been declining slowly over, it's not mm -hmm. just been one decade. It's actually been for quite some time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, here at the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, one of the reasons we've tried to connect those dots going all the way back to the 1800s when people started rejecting God's word as the absolute authority, they started replacing it with man's authority. We started to see things like man's idea of millions of years as opposed to a global mm -hmm. flood. And that started to be taught in school systems, you know, across this country. And so, you know, as we started to see that, we've, we've even seen those ideas infiltrate churches. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we end up with people sitting in a pew that reads God's word, talks about a global flood. It talks about God creating in six days. And they hear a Christian leader say, oh, we well, can believe big bang evolution millions of years. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, what's going on here? First thing they want to do is get out of the church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because like, look at this, the Christian leaders don't even believe the Bible. What am I doing right. here? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've dealt with a lot of those issues. You know, I know we deal with that in this book, uh, Flood of Evidence. Um, although that's not the reason I grabbed the book. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but. So the next one here, um, from coming from the uh, website Not the Bee, watch this young kid get baptized into transgenderism at a woke church. Wokeism is a cult, and this is straight up child abuse is the headline for this article. So I'm going to play the video here um, just for a little bit of context. This is from, it's a clip from an HBO documentary called Transhood, which is all about children transitioning to uh, live a transgender lifestyle. Um, and this is a Unitarian church in um, that is hosting this ceremony for this four-year-old uh, boy. Good morning. Good morning. Today we choose to recognize, honor, love, and celebrate anyone here who would claim their identity publicly as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, intersex, pansexual, asexual, or any category that I've left out. <laughs> this is Phoenix. Okay. I'm all I'm really sorry. You're a little shy. Do you want to tell everyone if you're a boy or a girl? I think it's my sister and I'm a girl. Okay, you can tell them that. <laughs> okay. Phoenix would like you to know that she's a girl and she prefers she and her pronouns. Awesome. This way. May you be well, safe, and whole. We honor you exactly as you are. I, well, <laughs> wow. You just, you watch that and you just, oh. You it's heartbreaking. Think, it, it really is. It's heartbreaking for the child. Yes. Who's it clearly, really is clearly not aware of the whole thing. Right. And it's just. This is what our world has come to, where this is celebrated and those who say that this is yeah. wrong and that parents should help their children to accept how God has created them to be, well, those parents are the enemy. Um, it's just... How old do you think this so little boy sad. was? He's four. He's okay. four years old. 
And I, I'm sorry, but I don't think a four-year-old could really know, understand yeah. the concept of no. gender identity. Right? Yeah. Right. And, and as this continues, this four-year-old will most likely be given hormones to suppress puberty, potentially surgeries that will mutilate his body further down the road. And it's just, it's so incredibly sad. And, and you hear these this Unitarian church, which isn't really a real church at all, right. quoting this, this mantra at the end about how we accept you exactly as you are, except you don't. Instead, you're trying to accept this um, idea that he shouldn't stay as he is, but should instead try and transition to being a girl, which he can't actually do because biologically he is a male. It's just, it's so inconsistent and it's just so incredibly sad. Look at the big picture of the attack on kids. Yeah. Uh, particularly in our culture. I mean, children are just being attacked left and right. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a war. Yeah. Uh, look at the number uh, of children just in the United States that have been aborted. Mm -hmm. You know, it's over 60, 60 million. million. I mean, it, it's shocking. And, and if they do uh, survive, uh, you know, get past that phase, uh, look at the rampant child abuse that's happening, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's sexual abuse, physical abuse, or being lied to left and right about all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And then they're brainwashed into, into believing evolution millions of years that they're just an animal, they're just a chemical, uh, and the gender issues. I mean, children mm -hmm. are under attack. In Family, this we need to be praying yeah, for the children attack. in this culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really just, it's horrifying to see, and it just points to how much our culture needs the truth of God's word. Because apart from the unchanging <laughs> foundation of God's word as truth, this is where a culture ultimately drifts into absurdity, mm -hmm. where you accept all these kinds of absurd things, and really where children pay the price. That's the way it's been throughout history. You know, children were sacrificed um, on, on, on mm -hmm. actual altars. Now they're sacrificed in you know, abortion clinics, but uh, sacrificed on actual altars. It's children who, who often pay the price for the absurdity that cultures come to when they abandon the truth of God's word and worship and serve the creature rather than the mm -hmm. creator, as Romans 1 talks about. And so often this goes back to the parent, and that's the situation mm -hmm. here. Oh, it was obvious, a parent, yes. but it's yes. the parent. Yeah, yeah. And, and they do point out that, you know, this wokeism is a cult, and it is, they're claiming pretty much that they're a religion. Even yeah, though yeah. They're clearly not, but it's, I think it's something we definitely need to keep our eye on because I think mm -hmm. we're only going to see this movement mm -hmm. growing Right, uh, yeah. In the future. So. And, and they mentioned at the end of this article, they say that th this false religion of, of what they call wokeism is designed to supplant Christianity. It has sacred scriptures. It mm -hmm. has churches, catechisms, sacraments, doctrine, salvation, repentance. And all of that is found apart from the truth of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're replacing, and we see this even when it comes to dealing with some of the different issues that are going on in our culture, um, like, uh, like race issues, for example, where you see how this entire religion has replaced what the Bible teaches right, it about, it. it's, it's a counterfeit, yeah, where it has its own idea of repentance, it has its own idea of, of you know, salvation, it's apart from Christ, apart from the gospel, apart from the truth of God's word. And as believers, we can't fall into that. We have to cling to the truth of scripture and be willing to boldly, even though it flies against everything our culture stands for now, boldly stand on the truth of God's word, proclaim the gospel and help uh, save, physically save children and also um, help them to come to know Christ and be saved eternally um, through the message of the gospel. So this next one here is just for Bodhi because he okay, wanted to talk you. about this one. <laughs> it comes well, from the conversation. He's one. very excited about this one. We created diamonds in mere minutes without heat by mimicking the force of an asteroid collision. Okay. Uh, so Bodhi's a material science right. man. So we're going to let him just wax eloquent about That's this right. one. That's right. This was my expertise. <laughs> you know, I used to deal with stuff like this in the laboratory all the time. But I mean, how many times have, have you know, I'm just looking at my audience. I don't know those people watching. But how many times have we been taught that it takes not just millions of years, but billions of years oh, it, to make this diamonds. This article starts with that. In yeah. nature, diamonds form deep in the earth over billions of years. That's how yep. the article Boom. starts. Yeah. So everyone's heard that right. at some and yet, point. Yeah. And yet here it is, them making it in minutes. Minutes. Yes. minutes. So how do they know Without it takes heat, billions of years in nature if they can do it in minutes? They've never observed that. And that, right. that's, a, that's a key point here. Nobody's yeah. observed anything over the course of millions of years. Uh, so anytime somebody says it takes millions of years to form something, that is not science. That is just somebody's idea that maybe it takes millions of years. And yet we've got a lot of different examples of the way that people can make diamonds. There's a chemical vapor deposition. There's a heat and pressure. But what made this one unique is it's the first time they've done it without adding the heat. It's simply from the way that they've applied the pressure uh, to be able to keep it in there. Now, a lot of people don't realize there's actually multiple forms of diamond. Uh, there's your, your typical diamond, which is a cubic-based diamond. It's like what you wear on your you know, engagement ring, that sort of thing. Um, but there's also a hexagonal crystal structure of a diamond as well, and that's called uh, Lonsdaleite. 
And what's interesting is they suspect, they've not been able to make that big enough to actually test its hardness, but they suspect that that could be 58% harder than diamond. And diamond's would, the hardest. That's right. Substance. And so, yeah, so, yeah for, for the normal diamond. So, yeah. Um, and they were actually able to make both forms of diamond the way they did this. And mm -hmm. so, to me, that was absolutely incredible research. Hey, it, does, it, sh it shows it doesn't take millions and billions of years to form it. <laughs> it can happen quickly. But, of course, the ones they created were... Yeah. Microscopic. <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> you couldn't small. see They're them. Small, the but it, it gives us an microgram. idea how it's made. They right, used yeah. to think this Lonsdaleite was only, uh, you know, just synthetically made, that it never mm -hmm. had any natural forms. But then they found a spot where, uh, uh, you know, a meteorite had struck pretty good, and they found little bits of it, and they're oh, it is natural. So they, that's basically what they did mm -hmm. is they repeated this. Uh, just absolutely fascinating research. I love it. So. Um, just so you know. I did a chapter on gemstones because a lot of people have been taught that it takes millions of years to form mm -hmm. opal or other gemstones and that sort of thing. But in this book, A Flood of Evidence, uh, Ken Ham and I did this, uh, put together a chapter in here on how it does not take millions of years to form coal or oil or gemstones. I mean, most of these things can be made quickly. A lot of times the volcano goes off by the heat and pressure, it forms all mm -hmm. sorts of gemstones. So mm -hmm. it doesn't take millions of years for, for most of those things, petrified wood and so forth. We can make these things quickly. Someone uh, in the comments here is asking, uh, does it still take pressure even though it doesn't take heat to form the diamonds? Yes, it yes. does take the pressure. Yeah. Now, what, what's interesting is a lot of times when you, when you press something really hard, it, it, it's like a deck of cards. It wants to slide out. And, and diamond is like that. But what they have to do is they have to stop those shear forces from allowing it to go out here. You have to basically hold it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I really compress it from each direction. And that's, I think they said that's the pressure was that. like 640 elephants standing on the tip of one ballet shoe. Yes, yes. That's so what they that said. part made sense <laughs> to me. <laughs> you know, with your ballet background, I can, that's you gonna, eight, 80 gigapascals. Okay, you know that, what a gigapascal is. That's going to be an episode for shoes off, isn't it? I can <laughs> grab those ballet shoes. And... <laughs> All right. So this next one. Again, one of these things, it's like, I never <laughs> thought I would have to talk about this, but here I am reading this headline, ethical cannibalism, here's a DIY kit to grow your own human meat. So just when you think you've seen everything on this show, you, you haven't, haven't. <laughs> mm -hmm. because there's this. So here we go. A group of scientists and designers have created a concept DIY steak kit to Grow your own human steak because that's what everyone wants to eat, right? Um, so this basically, you take a swab from your cheek and you grow it in a Petri dish using expired donated blood that they turn into a growth serum. And it grows around a mycelium, which comes from fungi um, mold, sca uh, scaffold thing. And then you grow your own steak. And it looks very appetizing. <laughs> I mean, I'm so hungry okay. now okay. looking at that. Here's what Barf. makes this... <laughs> Incredibly bad. Not not just the fact that I mean this is just gross thinking about it, oh. but it, it says here that this kit has been nominated for Design of the Year by the London-based Design Museum. Yes. Now think about this: in London, you can't go worship at church, but this is hailed yes. as a wonderful thing. <laughs> yes. Tell me that uh, we're not living in a depraved society. I mean, this is Romans 1 coming uh, to life. So, New forms of evil. And, and even when you think about the reason why they did this. So they say it's just a concept and they're not actually advocating that people do this. But then at the same time, they kind of were in the, in the original article. So was, that was a little bit confusing. Right. Why but, would you go through the effort of right, trying yeah. to create um, this if you weren't? The reason they said they're it. doing it is because, so many of you probably know, obviously there's a group of people who believe that of course, eating uh, eating any kind of animal product byproduct is wrong, and that um, even so, there's okay, been a whole apparently. push to grow lab-grown steak. So instead of you know killing a cow and harvesting the meat like you normally would, butchering it, instead they've tried to grow meat in petri dishes and create the same Which flavor they say and texture actually and everything. Might be on the market by next year. Yeah, it, like it's supposed to be like a, beef a is supposed to be available billion-dollar industry. Like it's yeah. supposed to be massive. But mm -hmm. they say that there's in, in the, the people who designed this human steak idea. See, there's ethical problems with that because it still requires them to use a serum that's developed from the blood of fetal cows. And so they say it's still ethically wrong. So they're like, it, mm -hmm. in order to get around how wrong it is to use in any way anything that comes from an animal, you can grow your own steak using cells from your cheek. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really what you see here is they're elevating animals 
above human life, and they're also devaluing human life and putting it even lower than the animals at the same mm-hmm. time. And it really is the reverse that happens in a culture that's abandoned God's word, where humans are made in the very image of God, and we have unique value and dignity and worth because we bear God's image. The animals do not bear the image of God. They don't have that same um, dignity and worth that humans do made in God's image. Certainly, we are to care for the animals. God cares for them. He made them. Absolutely, we are to care for them. Mm -hmm. But in Genesis 9, 3, God gave us permission to eat the animals in a post-fall, post-flood world. But here, what they're doing is saying that that is wrong, but eating human flesh is okay. And they're really, really just turning God's creation order on its head. You know, another aspect that that frustrates me is, you know, in, in the Bible, it talks about life being in the blood. And yet, just to grow this, they're taking blood. Donated expired mm-hmm. blood, mm-hmm. which is and yet exactly. we're, we're told not to eat blood yeah. and that sort of thing. So, so it's and it's just, like it take up to three months the process. So that's an awful long time to have to cultivate your own. I mean, it's just the whole process just doesn't make sense. It's, just, it's, it's ridiculous. It, I thought it was ugh. funny though because the manufacturer said, "You'll always know the origin of your food though if you do this process." <laughs> it's true. It's like it is. That's okay. True. I think I'll pass. <laughs> yep. Yep. I think I'll, I'll risk not knowing where my food came from. <laughs> Yeah, so in a culture that's wow. just abandoned God's word, you just you never know what is going to come next. Because, um, yeah, there's that. <laughs> so wow. if you have any appetite left, I hope everyone's had their lunch <laughs> before we did this. Episode. I don't know if I want to have lunch. <laughs> yeah. uh, depending on your time zone, it might be lunch. And if it is, I apologize in advance, uh, profusely for that. So, all right. This next article comes from New Scientist. Plate tectonics may have begun a billion years earlier than thought. Forget everything you knew about plate tectonics. It's all wrong. We always have one of those articles, themes every episode. Mm -hmm. This is our one for today. You know, and that's really what it is. You know, I don't know how many times I've been taught from earth science textbooks, geology books, and things like Mm -hmm. that over the past 40 years or whatnot. When I see something like this, basically what I'm saying is all those facts that you were taught, they're all wrong. They're all out of place. All that. Now, that's the secular world for you. You're taught all these supposed facts. Next thing you know, they're not facts anymore. They're false, which means they were never facts in the first place. So when people come up and want to tell me about scientific facts, hold on a second here. That should be a key word to you right off the bat. But that's really what they're saying here. Mm -hmm. You you look through it and they say, plate tectonics may have begun four billion years ago, almost a billion years earlier than we thought, according to this new analysis, which a lot of geologists Mm -hmm. don't accept. Some do, some don't. So it's all, you know, up in the air still. They're battling Um, But they have, basically, they have the wrong starting point, millions of years and evolutionary processes. So they're going to come to the wrong interpretation of the evidence because they're ignoring the flood, the catastrophic flood of Noah's Day about 4,350 years ago, which would have started plate tectonics and rapidly shifted things around instead of it taking Mm -hmm. millions of years like these scientists are going into this assuming. And, and when and, you abandon the authority of God's word, that's why you're constantly changing your mm-hmm. ideas and you're mm-hmm. constantly trying to right. ignore the eyewitness fit. account you're that right. tells always you always making it true. Do, do mm-hmm. you realize and you can't do that? A billion years in their worldview, this is this is gigantic. They're that's saying huge. that, that 3.2 billion years ago is when it first started. No, 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 now they're saying four billion years ago. I mean, that's that's like a billion years. Like phew, they keep that, thinking that if we just add more time, it's all gonna mm-hmm. fit. No, I want you to understand. It falls something. apart. You know, this whole concept of plate movements actually goes back to a Christian man in the 1800s, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini, and he developed this based on the idea of a biblical flood and the way that the continents uh, fit together and that they were uh, basically pulled apart during the flood of Noah's day. Now, he was laughed at by the secular world for the longest time, and then finally they realized, hey, you know what, there really are these plates, and they really are moving just a little bit. The problem is they denied that there was any mm-hmm. catastrophes in the past like yep. this that shifted any of that. They denied the global flood. So they just assume these things were slowly moving for what we see today. And they assume it's always been like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the problem. Really what we're seeing today is just the residual leftover Yeah, uh, you have motion to look at it the through flood. the lens of the history given to us in yeah, Scripture. That's, that's why around the plates, you, you oftentimes see where that's where the mountain building is or where you mm-hmm. see some volcanic Earthquakes, activity. Volcan- Earthquakes, Earthquake, Earthquake, the chronic uh, fault lines like that. and that rubbing together. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But, I just thought it was funny, like near the end of the article, they actually have six different, I counted them up, six different theories. They keep saying, well, this is it. Well, no, likely it was probably this, but it could have been this. And it just shows, they just really they, they don't, just don't know. have any idea. Mm-hmm. Right. The, yeah. the, the best line I thought in this whole article is one of the scientists who said, it really is a great misunderstanding of so many things. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yes. 
True yeah. words have never been spoken. Right. <laughs> yes, when you ignore God's word, you have a great misunderstanding about many <laughs> things. You're not going to interpret the evidence correctly because you're not looking at the eyewitness account of history from the God who was actually right. there and does not lie to us, as Titus 1-2 right. says. And, you know, any, any continental shifting would have essentially occurred during the flood of Noah's day. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the 150th day, we see the mountains of Ararat, which are actually pushed up by the Eurasian plate, the African plate, the uh, Arabian mm -hmm. plate, all pushing those up. So by the 150th day, we've seen a lot of that mm -hmm. motion and movement already. But yeah, that goes back to the yeah. flood, which was about 4,350 years ago. we have some great articles ago. about catastrophic plate tectonics on our website if and you're in interested this book, in knowing more about that. And in this book, there's that. Ah, It's just filling in on all sorts of stuff. <laughs> right. All right. I think you need to get a, a flood of evidence there you if you go. don't have it already. <laughs> right. Uh, our last one here comes from Science Daily. Zebra finches amazing at unmasking the bird behind the song. So they did a study on zebra finches to try and see if they're able to, to memorize specific songs from specific finches. And they found that the birds are actually really good at, mem at rapidly memorizing the signature sound of at least 50 different members of their flock, which is incredible for a teeny tiny little finch. Mm -hmm. Uh, they said at the end here, they said that it seems clear now that the songbird brain is wired for vocal communication, almost like God designed them I know. You to think a songbird live is in wired flocks? for right. vocal communication. Right. It makes sense, doesn't right. it? It kind of does make sense. It. And that works good for a flock to be able to communicate yeah. for motion, mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. all sorts of different things. And, and zebra finches specifically, they will they'll, they stay together as a flock, but then they break out and go to different areas and then they meet back together again. So this mm -hmm. way they're able to continue to communicate with each other, but not with other flocks that might be around. They know the so ones from their own flock. That sort of thing. Birds of a feather flock together, I guess. In this <laughs> and the most exciting thing about the zebra finch for me anyway, is because they do have a fingerprint pattern. There, you know, underneath their chin, you can see that their beak there and across their head. And no two zebra finch are the same. Uh, they have cool. a unique fingerprint pattern. You can actually compare those minutia just like you can a zebra or a tiger or, you know, other types of cats as well or human fingerprints. It's all the same, uh, each one being unique. So God loves his creation so much mm -hmm. that he gave every individual zebra finch that's ever been created a unique identity. So it's there, nice there, to think there's about. There's a comment on here so going back cool. to a previous one saying, how can so young a boy already be transgender. I mean, that's the thing. If, it, if they really are that young. Four years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think people can see it. Mm -hmm. um, I know, you know, boy, we've been dealing with all sorts of subjects and, and all that, but I know some of these, some of these were really bad, the cannibalism and the transgender uh -huh. child and, and mm -hmm. things like that. But, uh, you know, if I can ask you guys, please be praying for the church. I know the church is undergoing attack and I know kids uh, all mm -hmm. across uh, the world right now are undergoing attacks in a lot of different ways. So please be in prayer uh, for the church and for, for kids in particular. So, mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's all that we have for you today. But the Answers News team will be back again on Wednesday with a whole um, other group of articles to discuss those. So I hope you can join us again. Um, and God bless. Have a great day. And God bless you all.